what happened was that he received a permanently disfiguring fasciotomy all the way up his wrist as a result of Ogno's bite. Now, was that necessary? I don't know. Is it the norm? Absolutely not. Can it happen? Yeah, it did happen. So the potential is there. And, you know, again, if you look into the, the medical studies of the ones that did do something, the ones that did result in envenomations, some of them were quite protracted. They weren't dangerous, but they were causing, you know, skin discoloration, blisters, muscle pains, joint pains for months. It's, it's not just over in 12 hours. It, is a, it can be a prolonged process. This episode is a really important one. I feel the education within this episode is really important to the community at large. So the question of today's topic is, is a hog nose bite really just a bee sting? And to answer that, we have Francis Coschieri on for this episode. Thank you for coming on then, Francis. The question that I wanted to put to you is, are hog nose bites really just like a bee sting? <laughs> um, that is a long and complicated topic, which is great because we all know that I like to talk for a long time but my first reaction would be um, it's kind of a nonsensical comparison um, and not for the reason that people might think if you look at statistics so a bee sting a bee stings are venomous if you look at statistics around five people just here in the UK die every year from bee stings in the US if you look at statistics I think the average is around 60 people, uh, 62 deaths a year from bee stings. Now, nobody has ever died anywhere of a hognose bite. So I think it's safe to say, actually, bees are more dangerous than hognoses in terms of actual real world statistics and deaths. An order of magnitude more dangerous, <laughs> in fact. But there's a qualifier to that in that bees are everywhere, you know, um, you go outside and there are bees, whereas there are a limited number of people keeping hognose snakes. And of those people, a limited number will actually bite their owner. And of those, an even smaller number will have any kind of medical effect. So I'm not going to say that if as many people were bitten by hognose snakes as are stung by bees every year, uh, then we would be able, rather than we would own, only then would we be able to make a meaningful comparison between the two. What it is safe to say is that hognose snakes certainly are venomous. You know, they do uh, bite and inject a toxic secretion from their mouth via the, the back fangs. Um, and keepers should be more aware of that. So if we're going to look at what kind of risk, if any, hognose snakes pose, we've got to ask a few questions. One is, are they venomous? Well, there's a short answer. Yes, they are. But what does that mean? Um, two is how venomous and again do they actually pose any risk for the keeper and then three is how common are envenomations from this taxon uh, and what does that mean so if we look at are hognose snakes venomous first of all you've got to clarify what you mean by hognose snakes because again with, with you know getting pernickety if we're going to look at a common name. Well, hognose snakes could be heterodon, which are the common, you know, the well, the well-known North American species. Leoheterodon, the Malagasy species. Um, Xenodon, which are the Central and South American species that include what were once Lystrophis as well. And the short answer is yes to all of the above. Uh, they are all venomous. That again needs to come with a qualifier that just because an organism is venomous doesn't mean it's dangerous to humans. And I think that is what it's really important to establish. And this is the reason why you get so much kickback and argument to the idea that yes, heterodon are venomous. Part of it is, I'm sure, the fear among keepers that, and it is a justified fear because there are there is at least one state where heterodon are banned in America in America um, I'm fairly sure there's there are places in Europe where they are banned as well and they shouldn't be they're not dangerous to humans that that much um, is clear um, so I get this notion that yeah you're kind of protecting your freedom to keep these animals by downplaying it, their capacity to harm you understandable however if you do that, if you're not educating 
gatekeepers on the fact that yeah under exceptional and you know exceptional circumstances it, it's you know that again has to be qualified they can harm you um that in its own way is going to knock back and result in more bites because if people are not prepared and expecting that the animals can do this to you again under rare circumstances they become um more laissez-faire you know they, they will become just um less aware in other words and then that is when accidents happen and we've seen this i mean i used to one of the pet shops that i used to frequent and you know <laughs> knowing me i'd sort of go in in the morning and spend six hours there talking to them and then they'd close one of the uh, assistants there was a young lad who just used to argue blind no they're not venomous they're not venomous until of course he got bitten by one in a feeding bite he let it hang on to him and he got a fairly decent envenomation from it never argued that again um so yeah you you do get this all kinds of excuses uh, a good one is that they've got toxic saliva well i mean that's really all venom is anyway modified toxic saliva another is that they the the, the idea that they actually get venom from toads uh, and that they are retaining the poison of the toads that they eat which doesn't make any sense because if you've got them in captivity and you're not feeding them toads how are they still envenomating you how are they still administering you know toxic effects um so going back to are they venomous yes they're venomous um not all venomous snakes are dangerous uh if you look at off the top of my head um macroprotodon is a genus of very small rear fang snakes they certainly are venomous they envenomate and kill lizards um quite quickly uh, and i used to catch those in southern spain and gibraltar completely harmless to humans to the point that I actually don't even think they would be capable, even under a protracted bite, of creating even a swelling, uh, let alone what the exceptional effects of hog nose venoms are. On the other side of the spectrum, you do have rear fang snakes such as Rhabdophis, which are the Asian keelbacks. So Rhabdophis lateralis, Rhabdophis tigrinus, and Rhabdophis subminiatus. There are three of them that have caused nasty envenomations and even deaths in humans now that is a genus of around 30 species 26 to 30 species three of them are known to have caused dangerous you know severe envenomations and death how prepared are you to bet that none of the others in that genus are you know are dangerous personally i wouldn't risk it um you know it, it's just a case of being equipped with the knowledge to understand when you can push things and when you can't. So again, if we, we're going to debate, are they venomous? Yeah, they're venomous. But what does that mean? So you get a lot of people saying they're not venomous, it's just toxic saliva. And, and I always ask, well, that's a really weird um, way to distinguish it, because if it's toxic and if it's biting you, well, the effect is the same. It doesn't, it, you know, you, you get the same result. So what does it matter whether it's toxic saliva or venom if you want to distinguish them like that? Uh, but as we'll go through, that's not actually true. First of all, venom is modified saliva. That's, that's basically what venom is in, in a very general way. Um, and this idea of especially colubrid snakes having toxic saliva comes about from uh, the way that a certain organ what used to be known as the Duvernoy's gland um, used to be described. Now that gland is a homologue to the venom sacs of proteroglyphus, so elapids and solenoglyphus, uh, front fang vipers, vipers, snakes. Um, there are people that have described the secretions of this Duvernoy's gland as not venom. So for example, I know there's a researcher called Kenneth Cardon um who has stated um basically that because they're not all using the secretion to kill prey it can't be classified as venom the way i see it is that there's a problem with that kind of definition the problem being is that well actually there are lots of colubrids that use the secretion to kill prey but if you look at boom's langs dysfolidus typhus um boiger um there, there are lots of rear fanged colubrid snakes that are venomous that are using their secretions to kill prey the second issue with that statement is that well 
not all venom is actually used to kill prey. Venom is also used for other things, such as to warn off predators. If you get stung by a bee or a wasp, it's not going to kill you. It's not going after prey, although wasps do use the venom to paralyze prey. Just the pain itself is enough to ward off a predator. Um, the, the definition of venom isn't that it's used to kill prey. Um, so you can't just say, well, because they're not all using it to kill prey, that it's not venom. I think it's also important to say that, yes, a very large number of colubrids do have duvernois glands and don't seem to have that same toxicity to the same effect, uh, to the same extent as these snakes. But that's meaningless when there are some that do. If, if it is causing noticeable toxicity, envenomation, that's enough. I mean, if you want to uh, debate whether it's venom or toxic saliva, feel free. But the end result is the same. You're getting bitten and it's causing you, you know, all kinds of symptoms, which will go into, uh, you know, what kind of symptoms hognoses can cause. So that that discussion, you know, the idea that it's not venom, it's toxic saliva. For me, I find that very silly. Another thing that I've been told in the past um, is that any animal, if it bites you, for long enough can cause the same effects. And this was in a discussion uh, regarding an, an envenomation I took from a formerly non-venomous colubrid, which was a uh, thrasops. Uh, it's a species of arboreal black tree snakes from Africa that look a lot like boomslangs. Uh, and they're, they're very closely related uh, in the same family, the, the dysfolidini. Now, those are aglyphus. So aglyphus means that there is no grooved back fang. They just they do have an enlarged tooth at the back, as do many snakes, which is used for manipulating prey or perhaps for piercing frogs. You know, that that's debatable, but they don't have a groove. And what they do is they bite and chew saliva in in a much more primitive way than snakes that actually have adductor muscles, you know, grooved fangs that can actually inject. And I say saliva because it's the same thing. I mean, it, like the actual venom of thrasops has been studied by Dr. Brian Fry, the toxinologist. It's it's very similar to booms like venom. The method of delivery is primitive, and that way, it you know there is a scale of evolution of this sort of arsenal of of means of injecting the stuff into prey, starting with non venomous, then being able to secrete you know, toxic secretions, but having to chew them in, then having enlarged teeth and using those to, you know, more efficiently chew the venom in to the point of having grooved or hollowed fangs where they can inject it, you know, like a hypodermic syringe. Just because a species is further back along that chain um, doesn't mean that it's not venomous or that the venom isn't usable. It just means that it's got a more primitive mechanism for injecting it. And that well, that works in your favor. That's why there are very few envenomations by that particular species. And because of that, I was complacent and I got bitten and I let it hang on, having been told that they are in fact harmless. This is thrasops. And I experienced the worst envenomation of my life. It was a, it was a, a severe envenomation that others have made out to be far worse, for example, than the average small viper bite from, you know, Vipera berus, you know, the northern adder. Now, that doesn't mean that a northern adder couldn't administer a more dangerous bite under exceptional circumstances because people have died from adders. But it was enough of white to make me think, you know what? I wasn't educated about this. I didn't know. I spoke to a few researchers, including uh, Brian Fry. And, I, you know, I came to realize, actually, these animals are venomous. It is perhaps more difficult for them to actually inject the venom, but it still resulted you know, because of my complacency, that is the important point, it resulted in a very painful, protracted experience for me that I wouldn't want to repeat. And so it goes with hognoses. Now, I'm not saying that a hognose is anywhere near as potent as a thrasops, but it is the same kind of thing. Uh, it's this kind of complacency that people uh, get because they're told continuously, no, they're not venomous. Like, well, what's the problem with saying, yeah, it's venomous, in the same way that lots of animals are venomous, uh, but it, it's not dangerous. It's not going to harm anyone. If you let it chew on you, though, you might experience some side effects that you wouldn't like. Um, the other thing that sort of the other little myth, not a myth, uh, the other thing that's often said about hognoses, if we go back to them, is their toad sticker teeth. Now, I've seen the, the, uh, the picture that you've chosen for this particular video where it 
very well shows this this big back fanged maxillary teeth that, that they've got, which, you know, heterodon means different tooth, hetero, different don tooth. Um, they are from a, a family of snakes that are known to have, you know, strangely shaped um, teeth of different sizes. A lot of people used to say that these teeth are not back fangs. They are what we call toad stickers, which, you know, a lot of matricide snakes also have that rhabdothis use of a, a similar mechanism. Um, Ramnophis, the dagger tooth tree snakes also have a similar mechanism where, yeah, they can penetrate a toad whilst they're chewing. Um, now, these things are not unique to hog noses. A lot of snakes, including Samophis, which we talked about, also have enlarged maxillary teeth that are used to manipulate prey during capture, during chewing. They may play a role in puncturing toads because, as you know, toads do sort of expand themselves to, you know, to try and make themselves harder to swallow. But you've got to remember, nature loves efficiency. And so they probably do serve more than one function. For example, if we, in this example, puncturing toads might be a function. Manipulation of prey during swallowing. And yes, envenomation, getting this toxic saliva into the animal. Uh, another thing is that I've seen recently, in fact, what caused my little rant the other day when we were talking about Samophis, uh, somebody shared a, I think it was a Wikipedia article where they're saying they're not considered venomous. Um, and the venom isn't used for hunting prey. That's also not true. There is um, plenty of evidence that the venom of heterodon does affect amphibians. Um, and it even affects mammalian tissue, although we'll get to that later on. But in any, any case, yes, they are venomous. My philosophy is that getting bitten by any venomous species should be considered a big mistake. Handling them carelessly, knowing that they are potentially capable of not harm well harming you you know not hurting you too badly or killing you but you know harming you causing effects is stupid because you never know what can happen on a bad day you never know how sensitive you are when you're hypersensitive um even the relatively mild symptoms that we'll describe later such as edema swelling it sounds like oh yeah it's just a bit of swelling until you've got your hands twice the size as it should be the joints hurting the knuckles sort of disappearing as happened to me with my thrasos bite, I suddenly realized, oh, okay, so swelling actually is an extremely painful experience. You know, you can't put pressure on your hand. On paper, it just looks like, oh, it's just a bit of swelling. When you have a, a proper uh, bout of swelling, it can hurt and it will last a long time. So yes, heterodon are venomous. What does that mean? How venomous are heterodon? The basic, what we know is that, and again, going back to the whole venomous saliva thing, it's not just modified saliva. We have had several studies now where they have actually isolated the venom. They've taken the venom and tested it, and they've tested it alongside the saliva of the snake. So we've, we've actually got studies that show what the venom does and what the venom is composed of and what the saliva does. And that also does contain toxins, um, but there certainly is a differentiation between just saliva and the venom. Um, so heterodon nasicus, the Western hog nose, that's the one that everybody keeps. It does exhibit moderate snake venom metalloprotease activity and a high phosphodiesterase activity, which what that does is, is it disrupts cyclic adenosine monophosphate and it also has hemorrhagic toxins. So we've got a venom that does both a mildly neurotoxic effect and also hemorrhagic effect. It has moderate to high protease activity. What all, I mean, we're not going to get into the depths of what each protein does. Um, there was a 1992 study that identified postsynaptic neurotoxins or three finger neurotoxins, which probably, I mean, a lot of snakes do have those. They probably don't play as significant a role in envenomations, but they are there. And it should be noted that three finger neurotoxins are quite common across venomous snakes. The other thing that you've got to notice is that there is a discrepancy between in vitro data with amphibians and clinical manifestations of the different symptoms that we as humans get. And again, the reason for that is that we're not amphibians. So if you're asking how venomous is something, that depends on a number of things. It depends on the size of the animal that's bitten you, how the reaction time of the person being bitten, you know, have you pulled it out or have you let it chew? 
how long the bite lasts, where on the body the bite occurs. If, you, if it bites a finger, it's much easier for the animal to chew onto the finger and administer a meaningful envenomation. How much does the animal inject? Is the bite through clothes? All of these are factors in our favor. Um, you know, heterodon and most, the, the majority, not all, but the majority of rear fanged colubrid snakes, they have um, difficulty chewing into a large animal as us. That said, um, so some of the symptoms that you can get, uh, if we run through them, and I'll send you images of these from various studies or from Facebook. I mean, I've known quite a few people that have been bitten and have had an envenomation from ognosis. Bulli, fluid-filled blisters, which again, you say blister and you don't really... It doesn't sound too bad until you see the images of grape or kiwi-sized bright orange blisters sort of erupting from your skin. You realize actually that looks really painful. Hyperpigmentation, skin discoloration, echimosis, bruising underneath the skin because of damaged blood vessels, edema, swelling, lymphoedemopathy, swelling of lymph nodes, which, you know, sometimes when you get a cold, you can feel your lymph nodes hurting under your armpits or whatever. Well, it's as much the same thing. Um, mild cellulitis, so swelling, redness, pain in the skin, arthralgias, joints, stiffness, myalgias, muscle pains. And again, it, it sounds silly, but pain. Pain is a commonly uh, reported side effect of the bite. You can't discount just pain as a symptom because it hurts. There also was a recent study, I think it was in 2020 or perhaps 2019, that was the first time that it reported thrombocytopenia, which was a deficiency of blood platelets, which again, it, it it's a long word, you know, thrombocytopenia. What does that mean? Well, I mean, it basically it means that because you've got a deficiency in blood platelets, it causes bleeding into your tissues, bruising, and slow blood clotting after the injury. That was only a one-off, though. Um, and that was in a, a recent paper where a lady got bitten by her pet hognose, again, unknowing that they could do this to her. And she went into hospital and she was reporting symptoms for the next four months. You know, it, it, it was a prolonged experience. So although the symptoms are not, you know, the symptoms are mild, they're not dangerous, they're not going to kill you, you could be getting them for a few weeks, you know, in exceptional cases. Now you have to balance that and qualify that with, well, how many other people get bitten by hog noses and experience no symptoms? Because it's a lot, you know, and that's what's per uh, perpetuated this idea that they're not venomous. Most of the time, you're not going to get a envenomation from these snakes. And, you know, you've always got to factor that in. Uh, the other thing, if you're going to measure how venomous something is, so the, the accepted way, it's what we call LD50s. LD50, LD is lethal dose value. So lethal dose 50. What that means is it's the amount of venom required to kill 50% of a group of mice. And the lower the number, the more potent the venom. So if you look at, you know, for example, all the elapids, the dangerous snakes, most of them have got either an extremely low LD50 below one. Uh, so anything below one is extremely toxic. But a boomslang might have 0.8. And that's important because a boomslang doesn't inject much venom in comparison with some of the vipers, for example, that might have an LD50 of 2.5. But the sheer gargantuan mass of venom that they're injecting means that it doesn't matter that it's got a high LD50 because it's injecting so much into you that it's still going to have a toxic effect. Granted, there are problems with the LD50 scale when it comes to measuring toxicity on humans. Firstly, we are not mice, we're humans, uh, and such a thing as venom specificity exists. So many species have venom that are, they're adapted to kill a particular type of prey. Some are particularly toxic against lizards. Uh, for example, Malpolon, the Mopelia snakes. Some are particularly toxic against frogs, which you might expect um, an amphibian eater like Heterodon. Some are particularly toxic against birds. And in those cases, they may not affect mammals the same way. So that may affect the LD50 rating. So they might be less dangerous for us, but they are extremely toxic for the, the animal that they are specifically evolved to kill. Where the venom is injected is also a factor, which is why generally when you're looking at LD50s, you have 
at least four when it comes to snakes there are others so for example oral is one but you know most people don't drink snake venom although i have seen it but you know uh intramuscular in uh, subcutaneous beneath the skin intraperitoneal or intravenous you know into a blood vessel those will have different results um, so where you get injected and whether or not the animal is capable of penetrating your skin and getting into deep muscle or into a blood vessel is going to be a factor. So hog noses are not really going to be able to just puncture deep enough into your flesh to actually envenomate you into your tissues. They might pierce the skin. A gaboon viper, though, for example, will hit you with the force of a punch and penetrate two inches into your muscle. Then that's obviously a far more significant and dangerous uh, envenomation briefly uh, you could also say that there is the matter of geographical variation so we know that with some venomous snakes there is a variation depending on where you are in the world i mean this is well studied in vipera the, the european vipers where you know you can get a you know varying potency from ld50 to or you know 0.44 to 1.2 in vipera amodites in one place uh, which is intravenous so that's obviously very low but it, you know, and you might get it as high as two to 6.6 .6 elsewhere. And again, what we touched on before, venom potency, so the LD50, the lower number, isn't the same as venom yield. Just because a species has a potent venom doesn't mean that it's going to be able to administer enough venom to be dangerous to you. Those are all things you've got to consider. And that's a lot of waffle to basically say hog noses are venomous but they're not really capable of doing much more to you than causing not debilitating but you know they cause localized pain so it's not the fact that whether someone's allergic to it by chance or not it's this is venom it's just a whole myriad of reasons of the placement of the bite how much gets delivered whether it's into skin or whether it mag magically managed to get like a blood vessel in your finger or something it's just the myriad of reasons as to how it's delivered, not necessarily whether you're allergic or not. Absolutely. Although, you know, and, and I don't know whether or not there have been any true cases of hypersensitivity, allergicness or anaphylaxis from hog noses. Anaphylaxis certainly is a major problem with other venomous snakes. You know, people, if, you're anaf uh, if you get anaphylaxis from a cobra or viper bite, you'll be dead a lot quicker than if you didn't and if you weren't sensitive to snake venom. So... Certainly, there might be the case where, yeah, you might be more sensitive to it than not. But are you really going to bank on that? You know, is that something you're going to gamble on? You know, not knowing. Again, we talked about bee stings at the beginning. Most people will get stung by a bee and it's like, ow, and you'll go on with your day. In that respect, the, a, a nasty hognose bite will be much worse than that, and more prolonged. But a certain percentage of people were, are allergic to bee stings. And then you get stung, you get anaphylaxis, you know, your throat starts swelling up, your tongue will swell and you might drop dead so if you're sensitive to it then bees are a lot more dangerous to you than they are to everybody else so if they get you good they get you good like you're gonna have a you could have a bad few weeks regardless of how sensitive you are if they get you good i'm not saying that people cannot be sensitive or more sensitive there, there certainly is a spectrum of sensitivity but how much are you going to bet on that if you've not taken one before you can say oh, i'm probably not going to be sensitive to it so it'll be fine no just don't get bitten and then there's no risk. So that leads us on to the third and the most important, the, the point of all this, because it's all very well talking about are they venomous, how dangerous are they? And I'm sure there'll be people shouting at the screen saying, no, they're fine. I've been bitten lots of times. This never happened. Yeah, I was too. I was bitten by Thrasovs lots of times. And then I got bitten that one particular time and all hell broke loose. It was a very painful and, and nasty envenomation. Don't bet that it can't happen to you. Um, but yeah, how common are heterodon hognose envenomations? That's the important thing. Severe bites are supposedly rare, but there, and there is a tendency to view each case, each medical case, as an isolated or one-off incident. The truth is that it's a bit more muddy than that, because there are records of envenomations by hognose snakes all the way back to 1960, at least, and there are several... Um, you know, reports that came out in the 60s, one in 1960, one in 63, where people were bitten by hog noses um, and they did suffer the effects of an envenomation. So they're not that rare. Now, 
I can't speak for anyone else, but I know at least eight or nine that I could name just off the top of my head, people that have experienced noteworthy bites from hog noses. It's not that rare. The problem is, is that it's not reported very often because people expect, oh, I got bitten and it's swollen up a bit. I suspect that if everybody that had ever been bitten by a hog nose and experienced some of these effects reported it, you know, medically, you'd actually see a, a massive spike in um, numbers of, you know, medical histories. As I said, I'm personally aware of at least eight or nine among my own acquaintances that have been bitten and have suffered the effects, including a few of them that were quite bad. I mean, I spoke in the last talk we did about, uh, I think it was a fellow called Tom Hastings, uh, and I actually did screenshot the the image a few years ago uh, because it was that impressive. So he got bitten on the wrist by a large hog nose and it's, it swelled so much that the doctor judged that it was threatening his radial and ulnar nerves swelling itself. So he did what was called a fasciotomy where you incise or the, the wound to relieve the pressure of the swelling. A lot of people don't agree with doing that with snake bites, but I'm not a doctor, I'm not gonna question it. What happened was that he received a permanently disfiguring fasciotomy all the way up his wrist as a result of a hognose bite. Now, was that necessary? I don't know. Is it the norm? Absolutely not. Can it happen? Yeah, it did happen. So the potential is there. Um, there's certainly a robust medical literature supporting the idea that potentially hognoses can cause minor effects. Again, we have to qualify this. All every single reported case of heterodynamicus envenomation was by captive snakes during feeding with prolonged bites. There are no records of venomous bites from hog noses in the wild that I'm aware of. What does that mean? It means that keepers are idiots basically and are not they're trusting too much um, this idea that they're not venomous or that they're only venomous in certain situations and that is where it's hitting us. If you treat, you know, you wouldn't let a tarantula bite you. Tarantulas, or many of them, are, are, you know, the beginner species are not that dangerous. They're still venomous. You still respect the fact that, yeah, you don't want it to bite you because it'll hurt. Well, it's the same with hognoses. It's, you know, we're not making out that it is a dangerous animal. It certainly shouldn't be banned because they're not. You know, all it can do is, you know, give you a few minor side effects. And they certainly cannot threaten the public, you know. They only are an issue for people that are keeping them, that are not giving them the respect they deserve. And we know this because there was a study done um, by a fellow, I think it was 20, yeah, it was, it was only last year by a fellow called Damien Jelinski, um, which was in animals, just the, the journal animals. And they just did a questionnaire among a number of hognose keepers. Um, the, the interesting stats from that, study so nearly 50 percent of the keepers so it was 47.7 percent admitted that they had had a hognose try to bite them um and 60 percent no sorry 68.6 percent nearly 70 percent admitted to having fed hognoses with their bare fingers without using tongs or tweezers 70 percent of the keepers said that or 74 percent of keepers 74 percent said that they were not afraid of being bitten that's really brave it's also really stupid frankly um but it does give you a cross section it shows you why this is happening and why it continues to happen people just don't know now there are some you know and i completely understand there are some that will say they're not venomous they're not dangerous this is all exaggerated i've been bitten hundreds of times there have been hundreds of bites. yeah sure lots of people get bitten and, and don't suffer anything you're going to risk it um and you know again if you look into the the medical studies of the ones that did do something the ones that did result in envenomations some of them were quite protracted they weren't dangerous but they were causing, you know, skin discoloration, blisters, muscle pains, joint pains for months. It's, it's not just over in 12 hours. It, is a, it can be a prolonged process. Why not just treat the animal as if it can do this to you? Feed it with tongs. Don't let it latch onto you and, you know, pull your finger away if it does happen, snap at you. And never suffer it. That's all that, that's all that you need to do. 
Um, it really is as simple as that. But I think that survey was a really interesting one because it kind of displayed the attitudes that even now most keepers have with hog noses. They're just not afraid of them. And cool, you shouldn't be afraid of them. You should respect them for what they are, though. That, that's my case. I think it's interesting where people are trying to downplay it and then people that have no sort of bias will be like, well, hear this, and be like, oh, they're not venomous, cool, or they aren't harmful. But like like you say, like, it depends on how you define harm. Like, something absolutely messing my arm up for a week, I, I consider that harmful. I don't want... Like, you don't want to hit your thumb with a hammer. That's not going to kill you, but that's harmful. Well, and, and this goes back to uh, the Thrasops. I mean, I've had numerous arguments with African herpetologists, you know, and these are men at the top of their field. Of course, these are people that are dealing every day with mambas and saw-scaled vipers and forest cobras and boomslangs. You know, these are extremely dangerous animals that are killing people, and they are educating people, you know, to distinguish between harmless snakes and dangerous snakes because they know that the layman will kill snakes. And if they can edu educate, and if they tell people these are harmless, they won't kill them. I get that. Now, in the case of thrasops, as with hog noses, there is absolutely no chance that anyone is going to get a venomous bite from thrasops in the wild. It just won't happen. The snakes will move away because they, you know, they, they need a specific amount of time chewing to get that venom in, more so even than heterodon, because they don't even have grooved fangs. They have their aglyphus. They've got no back fangs. Um, However, you know, I, I started keeping thrasops in 2004, 2005, and I was being told they're harmless, and they're not. If you're a captive keeper, and only if you're a captive keeper that is holding them and playing them and manipulating the ants, sooner or later you might get a nip, and that's when you need to know you don't want to get nipped by this, you don't want to let it chew on you. It's the same with hog noses. They are not a danger to the public. However, they can hurt the keeper if the keeper isn't informed. I certainly don't feel like they are as beginner friendly or the beginner ideal beginner species that some make them out to be i i kind of wince when i see them being sold as someone's first snake i'm like should you really be giving that to a child like that should be a corn snake or that should be a king snake um like a hog nose like like especially like as a smaller body a smaller finger which means they are able to potentially deliver it a bit better than an adult's thing. Like, there's a myriad of reasons why I just think that's not a good idea. I'll be honest, a lot of people have said that to me, and I'm not always sure I agree. Um, the reason for that is, would you let a child keep a chili rose tarantula, you know, or one of the beginner tarantulas that can't do much? Would you let a child pick up a tarantula? If you would, and there are people that do, well, a hog knows... I, I don't see it as all that different. Being capable of doing something is not the same thing as being likely. They are great pets. They're good beginner snakes in that they are hardy. They often, you know, except for babies, you know, the neonates that can sometimes have a struggle to get them feeding. They're great, cute snakes. They do well in captivity. I don't see why anyone responsible wouldn't keep one. I think if you are going to have a young child, well, should a young child have a pet, you know, that they are solely responsible for anyway, if they're that young? I don't know. Um, if they are, you know, 12 years old or whatever, I don't really see a problem with it if they are aware of it. But then I come from a background where when I was that age, I was catching Latas vipers, which are, you know, front fang snakes and asp vipers and Sion's vipers, Montpellier snakes. So I'm a little bit more you know, uh, free with that idea. I mean, I've, I've been in South Africa and I've, I've met a 14-year-old boy living on a ranch who was keeping puff adders, which was crazy even for me. You know, and the, you know, he, was, he knew exactly what he was doing with them. So I don't know whether I would say that they are not, you know, that they're still not ideal for kids. Not, I, I don't think, in, in any more than I think any pet isn't ideal for a young kid. I wouldn't give a, a six-year-old a pet, you know, that they are solely responsible for. I'd certainly allow them to help out with their maintenance. But I wouldn't say that it changes the hog nose's position as a great beginner snake, as long as you are aware of what they can do and what they're capable of. That's the important thing. It's, it's not the, 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 uh, the result of this shouldn't be banning them or shouldn't be making them less widely kept. They should just 
be making people more aware that yes, they are venomous. It's not toxic saliva. It's not poison oak or poison ivy, as I've seen some people say to images of you know the ecchymosis and, and bullae that you've seen of hognose bites. No, it, it is a bite, a result of a snake venom. But that's it. It's not going to kill you. No one has ever died of it. It'll hurt you if you let it chew on you. But you know, how often has that happened? I've never been stung by a bee. I could be horrifically sensitive to it for all I know. Yeah. And, 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 to be, and until it happens, you won't know, will you? So are you going to gamble on that? I certainly aren't. <laughs> yeah, I think that's certainly the case where I think that if you come from a place of education and caution, you'll be perfectly fine. It's just a case of we need to stop misinforming ourselves as a community about the position of where they are like harm wise like be mindful of what the animal is respectful of what it can do and then you should be all right but don't just say like oh yeah it's nothing you unless you're allergic to it you're fine like that is just irresponsible i think that that's my opinion uh, and you know i can see why people want to downplay it because yeah there are draconian laws and there are always people against the hobby that are waiting to jump in and try and ban these animals you don't need to do that. They're not dangerous. You know, it, it's what I was saying with the Thrasops. They are not regarded as dangerous because no one's going to get bitten by one. They're only dangerous to the keeper if the keeper isn't responsible. Um, Hognoses are perfectly great pets. You know, the, if you consider the number that are kept versus the number of medical case histories, yeah, it's more than people think, but it's not as much as it could be. So it's, it's just a case of, you know, if, if you're going to protect the hobby, by sweeping the, you know, the, the unfortunate facts, the inconvenient truths under the rug, that's just going to result in more bites. And then that's also going to threaten the hobby more because when people aren't educated, that is when accidents happen. My opinion on protecting the hobby is meaning that there's, you know, is resulting in that there are no bites in the first place. And you do that by making sure that people that are keeping them are aware of what can happen and are not irresponsible with the animals, and then everyone's happy. Um, education, 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 basically. Which is the whole premise of AHH, and obviously this channel as well. So, perfect. So thank you very much for coming on, Francis. I think people will... I think people really enjoy this episode, and I think it will open their eyes of a lot of people if they don't already know. Well, and I suspect there'll be a lot of people that will push back and disagree, but, you know, it is what it is. You've, you've got, um, you can't deny that they are venomous. You've got the proteins, the specific proteins isolated from the venom, you know, that we know what they do. Um, again, I, in my rambling, I, I may have forgotten to touch on, so, oh no, I think I did. So they, they do use the venom to help incapacitate amphibians. It's slow acting, which... So they certainly wouldn't bite the animal and then let it go. They will bite the animal and then start chewing in. And people have interpreted this as toad sticking, you know, or soaring with the tooth. Who's to say that that isn't actually just administering more of this venom that is helping subdue the prey? It, it, um, but yeah, there's no denying that they have proteins in the novel proteins that certainly have toxic effects on amphibians and on mammals you know in, you know and what they can do perfect so we put all the education and information down on the table it's up to the viewer to assess that and judge their own actions based upon the information they've been put in front of them but as long as the information has been put in front of them that's the most important thing so thank you very much for coming on francis my pleasure